Hello and welcome to the Tough Girl Podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. Today, I'm delighted we're going to be speaking to Zoe langley Wathen, and we're going to be talking all about walking. Zoe has done walking in the Southwest and Wales coastal paths, offers Dyke and the Camino. So Zoe, you have done some incredible walks and you've got a real passion for getting outside, getting outdoors. Where did that all start for you? Well, do you know, it's a really interesting thing because it's something that I've thought about often because I, I don't come from a family that was sporty. I don't come from a family where, you know, we were encouraged to go out and, and uh, play sports or get out on our bikes regularly or anything like that. Um, but I did come from a family where we didn't have a car. Um, my dad worked for the railway, so we, we use public transport a lot. Um, and our, the nearest railway station was a mile away from the house. So, you know, even when we went on holiday um, as a small child, you know, we would all be responsible for carrying our own, own gear and um, walking down to the station. And it seemed like a really big adventure, you know, as a five, six year old. Um, and then that stepped up because I lived out in a, a small village on the sort of periphery, I guess, of a small village uh, next to fields. My brother and I, uh, he's five years older than me, we used to go walking down the fields of a weekend and go exploring. And then, you know, friends, I had friends that lived in the street as well. And we would go off exploring. Um, and it was sort of back in the day, I guess, where parents were quite happy for you to do that. Um, they would send you off out, uh, you know, have a nice time, here's a sandwich and see you at five o'clock. And I used to spend hours just wandering, um, you know, up and down this little lane that we used to call the Jungalo or uh, wandering down to the pit, which was near the farm where I lived. And the pit was this pond. It was just a small pond, but it was, you know, surrounded by mystery and suspense. And I, I imagined all sorts of stories um, that, you know, surrounded this pit. You know, perhaps there were things or people that lived in it. <laughs> so, so you know how a child's mind works. Um, and then that stepped up even further. I joined a youth club in the village and we used to go on night hikes um, and uh, day hikes as well. But the night hikes were dead exciting. They, they tended to be um, organised in such a way where you you were on like an obstacle course. You know, you had to diffuse a bomb with your team of six or you had to get your team of six over an electric fence um, that was six foot high and plus all your kit and there, there were all sorts of things like that so this kind of continued up till I was about 16 um, and in fact the last memory I think I have of that period um, was my brother inviting me to join him on a trek to go and search the sort the, the, I can't say um, my brother asked me to go and help him search for the source of the Yo, the River Yo, a very Somerset thing. And the River Yo was about less than half a mile away from our house. And uh, so one Sunday morning, uh, we took off and walked all the way out actually to the mouth of the yo. I think I said the source of the yo. It was the mouth of the yo. And um, it, it was so exciting. And I remember that being really one of, one of my first um, sort of family challenges that we embarked on together. Um, and we reached the M5 motorway. And all of a sudden, the, the river just disappeared under the motorway. And Chris said to me, he said, right, your choice then, Zoe. It's either over the top or under. And I thought, oh, good God. <laughs> and I looked I looked at this river that just sort of channeled underneath the motorway. And the only way of getting um, alongside it was to sort of shimmy along this huge sewer pipe. And I looked at that and I looked at the water and thinking, gosh, that looks really deep. I'm not sure I like the look of this. But then I looked at the motorway uh, and thought, well six lanes of traffic it was the 1980s so maybe not as busy it is now but uh, I didn't fancy risking going over the top so I went under and uh, yeah it scared me a little but I loved that it was it was really exciting oh 
your childhood just sounds so <laughs> idyllic and fun and going on these night hikes and turning into like obstacle courses and getting over the electric fence and finding the mouth or the source of the of the river I mean just how amazing to grow up to grow up that way I mean I suppose at that time you didn't know any different you know not having a car so having to walk everywhere it almost just became part of part of your life when did you um ever drift away from the outdoors did you ever sort of get to that place I don't know if you went off to university or you got like a like a job and then suddenly being outside all the time wasn't possible um it's funny because I I, yeah I guess I didn't really um do much in the way of hiking for a period, I guess sort of there's a, a period in my 20s. I, I did still walk. Um, I had my daughter when I was 24. Um, so I didn't go to university at that point. I, I went straight from school into a job and I was married young. I got married um, about a month to a couple of months before my 21st birthday. And I had my daughter when I was 24. And I guess I used to take Laura off out on walks I I used to I I think that love that passion that I had for walking and for being outside um my daughter became my excuse to 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 be able to get out and I remember purchasing my um first uh child-friendly backpack you know the sort that you you pop your child in and then then go off um that was fun that was really good but it wasn't still wasn't um a real big hunky type hike that you could get your teeth stuck into because you you know I just felt I couldn't I couldn't at that point and um it wasn't the sort of lifestyle that my husband was uh appreciating either he you know he was into sport he was into cricket and football um and I guess I just used to tag along tag along with that but there were times where I'd I'd you know definitely shy away from the cricket and the football and I'd say right I'm taking Laura out today and we're going to go and explore the new forest I should say at this point I'd, I'd moved down to Dorset by then um so I was exploring a new area um and places that I'd never been before so that was very exciting and uh, coming down to the coast and it was kind of real coast it wasn't um the uh, seven the river seven sort of estuary type coast so yes it, it was something that I did shy away from but I knew I knew that I always wanted to um do something bigger find something bigger um uh, but I, I was too immature to really understand what that was at that point. Well, when did that change for you? Because when did you have this dream to go and do like a, a long distance walking path? <laughs> um, well, I think at about, oh, I don't know how old I was, I think about 30 something, about 30, um, I moved down to a little village um, on the south coast called Lulworth, West Lulworth. That's about a mile away from Lulworth Cove, um, beautiful Durdle Door and, um, you know, the Jurassic Coast. And I can remember saying at that point, I would love to walk the Southwest Coast path. And then in the, in the very same breath, but I'll never be able to do it. I can actually remember saying that, you know, I'm, I wouldn't be able to do that. And so I, I'd sown that seed but I'd immediately stamped on it again, you know, so it it tried to grow, but it actually didn't have the opportunity to grow. I, I think it just stayed there. It just stayed dormant uh, for, for quite some years. And I spent um, four years living in Lulworth and then another five years living just a, a few miles north of, of Lulworth. So still within striking distance of, of the Southwest Coast Path and that beautiful area. And, and, I spent a long, you know, a lot of time um, just going out on walks there and appreciating it, and not really, still not really thinking, oh, I could go and do this. What? Well, where do you think those fears came from? Um, I don't know that it was even fears, Sarah. I mean, it's I maybe. 
I mean, there, there's definitely a, a family thing there, perhaps, where although I've, I've always been encouraged to do whatever I can do, there's also, um, you know, quite a, an old fashioned view of, oh, well, you know, are you sure you can do that? You, you know, my parents are, are, are quite elderly and um, I guess there are some things that, you know, they, they would say at that point, you know, don't don't put yourself in a position where you might be disappointed. Um, maybe not dad, perhaps mum, perhaps mum. So I think perhaps there was still an element of, of, of that um, entrenched in, in my psyche that, you know, I, oh, well, you know, I can't do that because I, I might fail and I might disappoint myself. But then I know that intrinsically I'm not that sort of person. I'm really not like that. And I do love a challenge and I do um, put myself out there and have a go at things. And I think also that the whole thing about the walk, the Southwest Coast Path, was that it was such a huge undertaking in my eye at that point, 630 miles. Gosh, you know, it's like, that's weeks of walking. And, you know, I hadn't done much more than a few hours of walking at a time and maybe a couple of overnighters. Um, so, yeah, I think I think it was possibly possibly also the fear of, OK, how do I go away for this amount of time and, and leave my family um, leave my responsibilities. And I think that's possibly a, a something that a lot of people and women in particular, you know, face that they, you know, they, they have their responsibilities that they have to, to meet. Mm. I mean, I actually love what you said earlier. Well, you know, when you had your daughter, um, because so often you hear, you hear the excuses or the reasons I can't do that because I've got a child or because I've got a daughter, whereas you'd actually flipped it and you were saying, because I have my daughter, I was using that <laughs> as an excuse to to go out, to, to get outside and to, you know, to go on these walks and to, you know, ha- breathe in that incredible fresh air. Mm. So you had this dream about the Southwest Coastal Path. Tell everybody, if, you know, because we do have listeners from all over the world. So just to expand a little bit more about the Southwest Coastal Path and when you decided that actually you were going to make this dream a reality. Well, the Southwest Coast Path, it starts in Minehead and finishes in pool it's 630 miles um, around the toe of the united kingdom and it encompasses so many different um terrains and yeah it's you know you have you have the um the gentleness of somerset um the, the rolling hills um and the ticks gosh they have a lot of ticks so I just had, I had this uh, memory that came back to me of, of being uh, caught by numerous ticks over and over again on just within the two days that I was walking through Somerset. Um, but it was beautiful, really beautiful. And then suddenly that changes into this um, ruggedness, this sharp, isolated, beautiful ruggedness of, of North Devon. And then that drops into North Cornwall. And then North Cornwall, you know, you're then starting to get into uh, sort of surface paradise and, you know, quite quite touristy artists. And that's, you know, art is one of my big loves. So for me, that that was great, um, kind of walking through these tiny little villages that were just filled with uh, paintings and artists and people who saw the world in the same way as me. And then you reach... Uh, the very tip of the UK. You, you reach Land's End, and and that's quite an emotional point uh, for anybody that's that's walking the Southwest Coast Path. I, I feel anyway, um, and it's also it's a turning point, literally, in that you you turn and you suddenly start walking the other way. You know, for um, for weeks you've had the sun facing you. Um, you know, you're walking into it, and then all of a sudden. It's generally it's generally on your right hand side and at your back, um, and that's quite a strange feeling to to suddenly have the sun in a different direction. It's it's uh, quite disorientating. So then you move through uh, South Cornwall again, very beautiful, um, and South Devon. South Devon to me, I mean that that 
is filled with memories of holidays for me because when we caught the train from our little village in North Somerset, we normally went down to Torquay. So we, we would go down to the English Riviera. And so it's, it's quite touristy down there. There's a lot of proms, there's a lot of Victorian bandstands. I suppose you could say for some quite a welcome flat area, but I love the hills. I really, really love the ups and downs. And yeah, and then and then you reach Dorset, and then Dorset, you part of Devon, and part of Dor- part of Dorset is then the Jurassic Coast, and uh, that is the most beautiful stretch of the Southwest Coast path. Oh, it just oh, it sounds so idyllic. So you've had you know, the Southwest Coastal Path; it's been in your mind for quite a while. When did you decide you were going to do it, and how long did you give yourself to sort of prepare and get yourself ready for the challenge? Well, it was. It was really quite um, a strange moment um, for me. In in the village that I grew up in, um, I was brought up going to the church um, in that village. It was a small village and this enormous church, uh, they used to call the Cathedral in the Moors because it was so big. And the vicar that used to be at that church whilst I was growing up, but then had long since left and moved on to bigger and better things he'd um gone off to um wells to wells cathedral and he'd become the archdeacon of bath and wells i think he'd turned 60 or 65 it's you know whenever you get the bus pass and he had decided he was going to go and raise money to help assist the wells cathedral uh, girls choir so the boys choir used to get the, you know, funding, the girls' choir didn't. So he decided he was going to go off in this bus pass pilgrimage. And I thought, what a great idea. I, you know, this this is, you know, really inspired. Um, I'd like to support him in this. And I hadn't seen him for a long time. And I, I'd hoped that if I popped into Wells on the way up to North Somerset to see my parents, that I might be able to see him, but I didn't. But my daughter and I, we popped into the, the cathedral office, went and paid our sponsorship, Uh, to support him doing that and then just took you know an hour's walking around wells very pretty little city we had a wander around and we wandered into waterstones and this would have been around about the august or september i would say of 2010 and at this point, I had, you know, the ideas of doing the Southwest Coast Path had long since kind of been pushed to the back of my mind. And I had been trying to think um, for months and months about how I wanted to celebrate my 40th birthday, which would be the following year in 2011. And I knew I wanted to mark it in some way. I wanted to pass through that that rite of passage almost of, of becoming 40 uh, by doing something that meant something to me. And I'd gone through the whole, well, I could go and do Machu Picchu. I could do Kilimanjaro. I could do, you know, all of these things, you know, you hear and you read of people doing that have been really inspirational. But it, it didn't resonate with me. There was something that didn't it just didn't touch me at that point. And I wanted, because it was my 40th birthday, I wanted it to touch me and to mean something. And so we just wandered into Waterstones and it was like this divine moment. Um, if you can imagine that that point in the Blues Brothers film where this shaft of light, this heavenly light is is hitting, um, you know, the people in the church, it was just like that. This, this shaft of light shining on one book, on a bookcase. And there it was, the Southwest Coast Path handbook. And it was like, oh, oh, yeah, that, oh, my gosh. And, and then all of a sudden, all of this passion came flooding back to me. And it was like, well, I grew up in Somerset near the start of the Southwest Coast Path. Um, I spent, you know, years hol- holidaying down in Devon. I, I in my teen years, I, I was a bell ringer with um, a friend of mine, and we used to go on these Devon weekends and um, amazing Devon weekends where we used to go and ring ring in church towers and then go off to the pub afterwards. Uh, and you know, there were all these links. I had um, ancestors who were tin miners, and now I was in Dorset, and I had lived within minutes of the Southwest Coast Path, and it was just like okay. This is it. And and I skipped to that hill <laughs> just 
you know, to pay for this book, knowing that there, you know, there had been some divine intervention there, or perhaps it was just a really good case of extra good advertising that the branding had worked <laughs> and I'd just been sucked in. But I'm so glad I was. And, you know, I just, I spent the next few months planning it. And I know I've heard you talk about accountability, Sarah. And I, I, I did this thing at school. I, I, I'm a teacher and it was sometime in the September, October, it must have been the October, I decided that I would do an assembly to the school and announce that I was walking the southwest coast path the following year. Um, and in doing that, there was no backing out. I, I had to then uh, go ahead and do it. I asked that I asked the head if I could take two weeks unpaid leave at the end of the school year because I was a little bit concerned. It was 630 miles. I didn't know what my capabilities were and I, I didn't want to run over. So I, I did take two weeks um, extra off in July. But yeah, so that was that was my story of how I <laughs> how I fell into doing the Southwest Coast Path. That's really interesting. I think actually, you said, you know, your body like, you know, filled with passion, you know, in that excitement, and it resonated with you. Seeing that book, it really connected. And that's the feeling that I suppose I want other people to feel when they come across their own personal challenge, whatever it may be. I love the fact you thought, should I go climb Kilimanjaro? Should I go and do the Inca Trail? And actually, it was the Southwest Coastal Path in England, you know, where you've grown up, something actually that you have been thinking about for such a long time. I mean, the accountability piece is so key. Standing up in front of the whole school and telling them, this is what I'm going to be doing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I can imagine with children, miss, miss, <laughs> how's, your, <laughs> how's your training going? Oh, you know, oh, are you ready for the path? I mean, also, an incredible, momentous way to celebrate or to bring in your your fortieth birthday. So, for me, it all feels as though it's coming together, and it's the right thing to do. It's the right time. How did your planning go and your preparation? Because, like you said, you you know you'd never done anything like this before. It's six hundred thirty miles. Were you going to be wild camping or staying in youth hostels? How did you plan that aspect of it? Well, I'd I'd planned to camp. I knew I had to get kit. I had to get quite a lot of kit. I didn't really have the right sort of stuff, um, you know, to take with me. So I'd left myself, I guess, about seven months um, to get that sorted. Um, I contacted the Southwest Coast Path Association um, just to get some information from them. You know, were there were there women that walked it on their own? Even you know, that was a, that was another big issue for me. It's like, okay, well. I want to do this on my own, but, um, you know, is it something that's done even? Um, and I know that's a, a strange thing to, to query, but, you know, I, I had had so many people say to me, what, well, you're doing it on your own? Are you sure that's wise? And it's like, well, why not? And so that's why, you know, I, I went to them and I said, is this something that people do, women do on their own? Yes, yes, it's fine. They've said. So in terms of um, planning. My daughter by this point was um, 15 and she w- she was going to be turning 16 in the April and I was going to be going off in the July. And, and she was very mature for her age in many ways. I felt comfortable about leaving her. She was left on her own for nine days, which I think she found uh, actually hugely liberating. And, um, you know, she's kind of said to me since that she she learned such a lot in, in that period. And I, I taught her how to cook, you know, she, she was able to fend for herself. But then, she, yeah, she had somebody with her for the time after that. Um, so, yes, I had Laura to think of in my planning. I had my mileage to think of in the planning. You know, how many miles was I going to walk a day? Even could I manage per day? And so I started going on training walks. And it, in particular, you know, the, the hills around here, they're not mountains by any means. You go up to Wales or Scotland or the Lake District for the mountains. But, you know, these these hills, some of them that you cope with on the southwest coast path are they're short, sharp shockers. They're, they're knee breakers. <laughs> and um, people very often will underestimate that. And especially if you're carrying, um, you know, weight on your back. You know, that when I did actually get started, that was my first lesson. Um, you know, if you've got 15 kilos on your back, 18 kilos even, I think I started with 18 kilos, um, it's going to break your knees. You're going to hurt. And I did. 
you know, I, I learned very quickly what things I needed and what things I didn't. And if I think about the kit that I have now, I mean, I really should sort it at some point and just sell it on. You know, I, I laugh about it. I bought a, a, a duo egg holder. <laughs> it was this little yellow plastic egg holder. <laughs> To, to carry two eggs with me on my backpacking trip around the southwest coast park well yeah, that got sent back very quickly um i had a frying pan so i could fry these lovely little eggs <laughs> and i think i had some kind of idyllic view that i was going to be you know walking past little country cottages little farmhouses and i was going to go and knock on the door and say can i buy an egg from you please <laughs> it really didn't happen and i had kit uh, things like something that turned my uh, thermarest into a chair. And, you know, I, I thought, OK, do I really need this? Is this something that if I didn't have this, I wouldn't be able to survive the walk? And no, clearly I didn't. So so this 68 litre Osprey pack that I bought was soon pared down. It was 68 litres and about 18 kilos. And my shoulders absolutely killed in the first two weeks. I sent stuff back. I, I soon got it down to sort of half the weight that it should be. Many people have a dream or, or this, this goal that they want to accomplish. And I'm just wondering, was did you find it much of a shock, you know, your ex in terms of your expectations, this big dream that you'd have, to suddenly the re actual reality of doing it and getting out there, dealing with these, you know, short, sharp um, climb. No, what did you call them? Short, sharp shockers. shockers. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so dealing with these short, sharp shockers of climb, these knee breakers. What was the difference between your expectation and reality while you were out there? I actually, I don't think there was a huge amount of difference other than the fact that I found I was less fearful of being on my own. In fact, I, I absolutely drunk it in because I was, I was able to absorb my surroundings. I was able to say hello to people. I was able to just experience that beauty of being able to walk and think and plan you know, that being able to, you know, I was, I was, I was planning to begin with, I, I was planning lessons, you know, for six weeks time, you know, what, what am I going to do when I go back in September? Oh, I know I'll do this, 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 and this. Um, and it's funny, I don't do that when I'm walking now. I've, I've stopped that. And, and I think my thoughts have changed. Um, so I think I was, I was getting, trying to get to grips with keeping in contact with the people who were following me and you know this was 2011 so I didn't have I didn't have a smartphone it wasn't something um I'd thought about at that point I, I had to kind of try and find places to go to and you know borrow people's computers and kind of type things in so, and yeah the camping the wild camping I had planned I had planned to camp it all the way around um but if there were places where I had opportunities to stay or you know I was I was invited to stay I would I would use those and for me I think that was the big game changer the acceptance of staying at people's houses actually changed changed the whole um, it, it changed the way I felt about the walk and it's something that actually stayed with me until the very next trail that I did where I decided, okay, I need to wild camp the whole thing. So what happened was um, I contacted um, somebody. It was uh, an old school friend of mine. Um, her parents had moved down to Cornwall and I contacted them to say, would it be possible if I could just stay just for one night? Um, I'm going to be passing through there roughly about this time. And they said, oh, it would be lovely to see you. Come on in, Zoe. So I stayed the night and we had such a good catch up. I hadn't seen them for years, years and years. And they were both retired. And the following morning when I, I went to say goodbye, they said, we've been talking and we would like to invite you to stay for the period that you're walking from where we are in Cornwall all the way around to Foy. 
And I said, oh, thank you. Oh, you know, I, I kind of took their invitation up with open arms and I said, thank you so much. That would be wonderful. And they they said, we'll come and pick you up uh, when you finished in the evening and then we'll drop you back off again in the morning. We will fed you. You can have a shower, somewhere to sleep. You don't have to take all of your gear with you. You know, leave your tent and everything here. Just take what you need. And I thought, what a wonderful, wonderful um, gift. And and they said, you know, this is this is our gift to you. We don't mind doing this. This is kind of like our, our way of sponsoring you. And as wonderful as it was, and I still, you know, hugely appreciate that time that they gave to me, I actually realized how much I missed. I missed wild camping at Land's End and at Senan Cove. I missed the sunrises and the sunsets. And I had that added pressure in the back of my mind all the time. Okay, what time is it? Um, I need to be back. I need to get to the next point at such and such a time because I'm going to be picked up at, at this time. And it's it just changes the dynamics of, of your walk. So I was, I was so, so grateful to them uh, for giving me that that opportunity and and for taking the pressure off my back and 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 she massaged my feet every night bless her that was absolutely beautiful but I needed to I just needed to take back that opportunity for me to be out there on my own and wild camp and actually up until that point I had never wild camped on my own before and so I I got to I said my goodbyes there and I got to a point and do you know I actually cannot remember the name of this point now um, it might come back to me in a while um, but there's a, a marker on a headland and it's the most unusual marker it's, it's painted red and white stripes and I knew that on this particular night this was going to be the, the time that I first wild camped on my own. And I remember my tummy churning, thinking, okay, this is gonna be this is gonna be a toughie, but you know, come on, Woth, you can do this. And I set up, I can actually remember setting up my tent next to a stile, but it was between a stile and a gate. Why I did that, I have no idea. I guess I just thought that I was uh, going to be safer there or something. It was at the Gribbin. It's come back to me now. It was, it was a place called the Gribbin. And um, I, I guess because I was setting up my tent as it was getting dark, I wasn't quite sure how much further on I, I needed to go where, you know, till I found somewhere that was suitable. And I wasn't even experienced, actually, in knowing what was suitable. Um, you know, what, what sort of pitch was I looking for, you know? Um, so anyway, I pitched there and everything was fine. I got everything set up and got into my sleeping bag. And I woke up at about 2.30 in the morning and I thought, oh, God, I need a wee. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's like, oh, maybe I could just hold it. I'll be, oh, I'll be all right until about 5, 6 o'clock. I'll be fine. And then it's like, no, come on, Woth. You've got to get out. You need a wee. Yes, it's going to be dark out there, but, you know, you need a wee. And you kind of go through this coaching yourself into <laughs> getting out of the tent. And I unzipped my tent and I just remember gasping. I mean, I'm sure you've experienced that, Sarah, that, that, that sheer beauty of so many millions of stars that just light the sky with, with no light pollution anywhere they are just there in their thousands it's just incredible and in that moment I forgot that I even needed a wee I just I just sat there thinking this is incredible and I want more of this and that's when I realized I've I've missed I've missed it all around Land's End and all kind of um the north side of Cornwall and I thought okay I, I need more of this. Um, so yes, yeah, so it was it was the most oh, awesome experience ever. What was it like finishing? Was it was there obviously happiness for finishing, but a tinge of sadness that it was over? Um, 
yes, there was a bit of both. There was, um, I mean, I'd met quite a few people en route, and you know, there's. I don't think I don't think I would ever meet a group of people like that in that those sorts of circumstances again i've been on lots of walks since and we've met some wonderful wonderful people and we've stayed in touch but this particular group of people um it, it just worked really well and we decided we kept bumping into one another you know on and off throughout the walk and it's like you know you think they've gone you think oh yeah they you know they walk faster than me i'm not going to see them again for dust bye <laughs> and then two days later it's like oh hi how are you doing I thought you were long gone and you realize they've taken like half a day off or you know they, they'd stopped to see somebody um, yeah so anyway that's kind of the way it worked and we decided that for the last two weeks we would try and walk together and aim to finish on the same day so that we had that opportunity to celebrate something together now and because I was doing it as a, a charity walk and I'd involved the school very much in in all of this. Um, I'd invited a couple of the charities that I was raising money for to come and join us on the last stage of the walk between Swanage and Poole. So that's about seven miles. And some of the students from school came and they walked with us as well. And then we got along to close to South Haven Point where there's a, there's a nudist beach and, and even more people um, joined us and it was just like this huge posse this this wonderful group of people that had come to um, wish us well and to say congratulations and so that was that was a real high point I was I felt so elated with achievement and the fact that you know there were all of these people there to say you know well done this is, you've actually done something that is perhaps beyond what most of us think we can do and it was beyond what I felt I could do and then yeah sorry go no I was just gonna say what was the impact on the rest of your life after completing this challenge I mean did it change your your perceptions of you and what you could do and you what you could do in the future because you know it, like like so sorry I interrupted you but like, like you said you know it, you felt as though it was beyond you but it wasn't you've just walked this 600 and 30 miles you've completed this dream you know the southwest coastal path I mean how long did it take you in the end it took me 47 days um but I had had to take a I, I took a couple of days out there in fact I took five days out um because my nan passed away three days into the walk so I, I got to Tintagel and it was blowing a hoolie down there it was windy and rainy um gusting sort of 30 to 40 mile an hour winds and I just thought this funeral is going to be happening and I really want to be there. I don't know how the hell I'm going to get back for it, but I need, I need to get back so I can go. And so, yeah, I did, I did take time out there um, to leave. Um, that was 10, 10 hours to, to get back to Paul from, from Tintagel. And but going back to the, the original question of, um, how I felt. The first part was the elation. The second part was a, you, there is a real drop, and I felt a real grief of leaving the trail behind me. Um, and that was quite hard, you know, of coming coming back to home life again. And ho home life I love, but it was just not being outside in this this beautiful environment. I've forgotten what the question was. The second part of the question was... Yeah, just in terms of what was the impact on, on the rest of your life from completing this challenge? Oh, that's know, right, yes. In terms yeah. of whether it was changing your perception of you and what you could mm. achieve and what you wanted to do? Yes, yeah, so it's it's the first, the immediate first way it changed my life was all of a sudden my wardrobe had to change. Um, I had dropped down two dress sizes. I'd gone from a size 12 to 14 down to a size 8 in seven weeks. And that was a real shock. Um, so that was my first thing. It's okay, right, change, change that side of things. And that, that also was involved in my grieving of, of the path because all of these clothes that are part of, of, of me, of, you know, who I am and my identity just had to be shelved. And I've never worn them since. You know, that is that completely has never come gone back again. Wait, um, sorry, this, the size 8 clothes or the size 12 or 14 clothes? The size 12, 14 clothes have never come back. I've I've stayed I've, I I fluctuate between an eight and a ten now depending on of whether I've been walking or not, but in terms of my own belief in myself, 
that was immense. Uh, you know, the the what that gave to me, it was like absolute total yes, you can do this, Zoe. You you have you have just achieved this. You have just walked six hundred and thirty miles. You said you couldn't do it. You have thought you've put your put this on hold for fifteen years or more because you thought you could never do it. Why did I waste that time? Why didn't I just get on and do it before? Um, and so, what actually turned out, or start sorry, what actually started off as being a once in a lifetime walk. And that's all it was going to be. It was just a walk that was going to mark my 40th birthday. And then there you go, tick, done that. Now let's get on with middle age. Um, All of a sudden people were saying to me, okay, so what's next? It's like, oh, yeah, okay. Um, Oh, yeah, I could do something else. Yeah, I I can do this, definitely. And thinking, gosh, really? Can I? Yeah, I can do it. I can definitely do it. And then all of a sudden I started looking, actually searching for, for the next challenge. It filtered into my life at school. Um, I felt more confident, more able to talk to people um, about what I had been doing. Um, I, f- I felt there was a trust there with the students. You know, they listened. They, they wanted to listen to what I had to say. Um, and they, they trusted that what I was saying was go it was something that they could take with them and be inspired by and i have had i've had conversations with students since i've left sorry not since i've left <laughs> since they've left i i i bumped into a student in a pub completely randomly she was serving behind a bar and I, I looked at her and I recognised her and I couldn't remember where from and she told me who she was and she said, you know, she said, I'll never forget that that assembly you gave us after you'd finished your first walk. And she said, I've gone off and I've, I've done part of that walk now. And I think they, she'd done five days or something, went and camped with her friends and she's in her 20s now. But, you know, and I, I thought, wow, that means so much to me that, that it not only gave me the confidence to know that I could go off and do something else like this, but it's given others the confidence. And and for me, I work in a girls' school. That's even more important because I hear so much, I can't do that, or I'm frightened of failure. Um, They're very risk-averse. They're they're bright students and they're very risk-averse. This kind of whole building up resilience is, is a really important area for me to work on for myself but to try and encourage these young young women these young females that they can do it oh I have to say isn't that just amazing though you know you you know you've done that you're obviously doing the challenge for yourself but sharing it with the girls and for it to have such an impact that even years later she's telling you I'll never forget that assembly Mm -hmm. yeah that's that's almost like that is what it's all about is you know, the fact is you have gone out, done this incredible challenge, it's inspired other people around you. What what was next? What did you do afterwards? What did you decide to do? Well, the following year, um, the, the people that I'd met on the walk, we decided to uh, rock up to Cardiff in May the following year and go and see uh, another friend of ours, um, Ari, who I think you've actually had on on the podcast, Ari Beresford um, Webb or Ari Kane, yes, as she is now. Ari Kane now, yes, yeah. Um, we decided to go and see her in uh, to Cardiff because she she ran all the way around Wales, and uh, we wanted to be there to cheer in for the last mile, and that was a very special moment. I was so pleased to to be there for that and to celebrate her achievement, her amazing achievement and to be there for the opening of the Wales Coast Path. So Ari came in and she handed the baton to another chap, Dave, and he went off and took off and and walked all the way around Wales. And I remember looking at him thinking, you haven't done this before. And I'm thinking, you're exactly where I was this time last year. (laughs) He had the biggest bag on his his back. And I thought, yeah, you're not going to last five minutes with that. It'll be a few... A couple of weeks maybe and you'll be shedding things out of there and actually I remember talking to him after or reading somewhere perhaps in a blog of his after that I think it was hours 
hours after leaving, he, he I think he sat in a bus stop and decided he was going to shed this stuff out. So anyway, we we sat in a pub and we we celebrated with Ari and then we got chatting and it was like, we could do this. Wales Coast Path. I was like, yeah, let's do it. And I was quite peeved because the lads that I was with, they they said, yeah, we'll, we'll go all the way around. We'll do what Ari did. We'll, we'll walk all the way around Wales. So it's Offers Dyke and Wales Coast Path. And I was like, I can't do that. It's like 1,047 miles. I am not going to be able to squeeze that into my six-week holiday. Not, there's just no way I could, could have done it. And so I ended up meeting them. They, they did nine days on Offers Dyke. Um, and I met them at Chepstow at the end of July, 21st of July, I think it was in 2012, and carried on with them to, to Chester. And that was an amazing walk. It was 870 miles. It was further. It was further than the Southwest Coast Path. But it was it was not as hilly. There are there are some there are some challenges in there. There's definitely some hilly bits in there. But certainly the Southwest Coast Path was still the knee breaker. Um, was it dif- yeah. was it different doing it um, with with your friends this time instead of it do, doing it by yourself? Um, it was, but you know, I'm I'm a very social person. Although I I love my own company, and I've always told people since you know since I've been walking like this, I've always told people I never feel alone when I'm walking alone because I'm either appreciating the beauty of the area around me or I'm thinking or I meet people and I say hello and I carry that with me until I meet the next person. Um, but walking walking with these people was actually, it's almost like therapy, I guess, because when you, when you sit in front of somebody, um, you know, across a table and you talk to, talk to somebody, um, the dynamics of that is completely different to when you walk side by side with somebody. You know, there's no eye contact, or if there is, it's not a lot. There's the whole thing about what goes on tour, stays on tour. You know, you chat, you chat to people, you open up unknowingly, really. So you don't plan to open up, but you you tend to talk about your life and your relationships and your past and you know what what you do for a living and what you enjoy, what you hate, all of these sorts of things. And before you know it, within two days, somebody's had your life history. Um, and there's something quite therapeutic about that. And you know that, you know, the chances are you're never going to see them again. Although in this case, that wasn't, you know, that wasn't what happened. But, you know, I'd already built up this friendship with Steve and Mike. And I knew I could trust them. And and we just, yeah, we just walked and talked. We also had this understanding that Steve had long legs. And just, he was like crazy legs crane. He could just walk and walk and walk miles and miles and miles a lot faster than we could. So that was fine. And he'd just meet us, you know, whenever we got there. And with Mike and I, we would walk and talk. And then I tend to walk faster than Mike. And yeah, it was just a case of an unspoken rule, really, that, you know, if you've had enough, you carry on, you you just keep walking. You don't actually need to say anything. You don't just need, you don't need to say I'm going to walk on now because I've had enough of walking with you. It's just this fluid thing that happens. And so you just carry on walking and then you get to the next village or the next pub or the next kiosk or the next viewpoint, the next top of a hill, whatever it is that seems natural, a natural place to stop and you stop and you wait. And it just just happens like that in a very... um, kind of friendly kind of way it's not anything that anybody needs to feel that they have to explain yeah so so what would be the ultimate walk that you'd like to go on and do do you have a, a walk or oh. I'm sure you have I'm sure you have many <laughs> I've got a list that is as long as my arm all of the the walks that I would love to do I mean I've, I've just you know last year uh, or this year this year um, discovered the great trail in Canada thinking oh wow that would be wonderful 21,000 kilometers I think it is 15,000 miles and that that would be immense I would love to do that I don't think that's going to happen for a while yet there's a few other commitments that that need to be taken care of 
first. But no, in my so say you heard it here first. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. That is that is the one I would I would love to do. But no, I mean certainly the Triple Crown, the the American Triple Crown, the AT, the PCT, and the CT. I would love to do that. And I mean, even just doing the appellation, I, I've absolutely um, absorbed watching your your vlog, and just gone, oh my gosh, I would love to be there. I would love to be there. And it's like, and I, I've kind of felt, I felt I've walked it every step of the way with you. So I've, I've really, yeah, that's so you, been wonderful. You, you've ticked that one off the list. You can be straight on <laughs> yeah, yeah, PTT yeah, now. Don't, don't, don't need to do that one now. <laughs> I well, I guess. The next, the next mini one for me will probably be the Ridgeway, um, which is just a, a short dab that's about 87 miles. And I'm, I'm hoping to do that in the spring um, next year. And I would, I'm planning to do that solo. Um, I'm very keen to keep, to keep my identity and to keep my, uh, my ability and my confidence to walk on my own as a female. I'm remarried now and yeah, so even though I enjoy walking with my husband, I, you know, we both know that we like to do things on our own too. So he, you know, he went off cycling from Wales to Spain two years ago um, and took three weeks to do that. And that was absolutely fine. You know, that was great. And so, you know, I, I get to do mine, mine as well. I would like to walk around Dorset. And actually, I had planned, I had planned to walk around Dorset back in 2014 but I went through quite a um a hurt a hurting split that's probably not the that's not the right word it was it was a a relationship split it was a long-term relationship and it was a split of shocking prematurity that I completely took me by surprise and so the planning for the round Dorset walk just you know had to be put on hold and it, it couldn't happen whoops my cat's just tried to <laughs> mount the laptop <laughs> come on um so that's still on the cards that's still one that i would love to do and that there, there is actually a, a a trail book called the around dorset walk uh actually i think it's it's round dorset walk um but i i'm not particularly happy with the, with the places that it takes in because it doesn't actually take in all of the areas that are, are right on the boundary like Lyme Regis for example it cuts off Lyme Regis so um, there's a, a tradition in Paul called beating the bounds where um, they do this mock-up of where you know hundreds and hundreds of years ago when they didn't write things down they they still had to make sure that the children of the um, the groups in the area and the families knew where the boundaries were so they would it was awful really awful they would take them out to the the boundary line and beat them so that they remembered where this this line was um now obviously i i don't approve of that um but there is still this this tradition that they still take uh, they still go out with a drum and they they beat around the bounds of, of, of the uh, parish or of the town or of the, the county and I just had this this kind of vision of finding or marking the Dorset boundary myself um, and walking it it's quite an undertaking I started started the planning for it and you know by the time I discovered that the boundary line goes along these really busy roads and th through the middle of the river, the River Avon, I think, was one of them, um, and through plantations. And I, I was thinking, how on earth am I going to navigate this? But, you know, my, my love for maps, um, I studied these OS maps <laughs> over and over thinking, OK, I've got to find a way through here. This, you know, this, this can be done. Um, so, yeah, that's that's a little one um that will be in the offing at some point. Um, and I say a little one because it's about 180 miles. So again, it's not not a huge one. I like the fact that you're that you'll want to continue to do stuff solo to keep up your own confidence and belief it belief in your abilities. I think that's you know that is so important. In terms of advice or tips for other women out there who there's almost two aspects to this. There's one who may have been putting off a dream. You know, like you said, why did you wait 15 years to, to do this walk? And then, so something, you know, any advice around that? And then the second one would be just in, in general about getting outdoors, going walking. What advice would you have, have for women who want to do that? 
Um, well, I think in terms of um, about not waiting is, is what's holding you back. I mean, for me, I guess at the time it was my family. So, you know, Laura was young. I, I sensibly couldn't go off for six weeks with her, you know, leaving her at home sort of under 16. I didn't, I didn't feel I could do that. However, in hindsight now, I don't think there would be anyone that's done a walk with their teenage uh, daughter or son that would regret that afterwards. I, I think I think I could have taken Laura with me, um, and I think she would have been empowered by that as well. And I I, I almost wish I'd, I'd done that when she was much younger, you know, given her that opportunity to come with me. Okay, you know, you have to adapt things, you know, you can't expect them to walk 25 miles a day. Um, and you certainly probably wouldn't feel able to carry a, a, a youngster on your back for, for 25 miles a day. But there are ways of, of adapting um, your own lifestyle and your own situation into something that you want to achieve something that you want to do. And I guess, I guess that's what I was doing all the way through my 20s and 30s. I was preparing myself mentally for this without even realising I was doing that. And and still going out. I was still going out walking. I was still hiking. And Laura, actually, you know, she had her first pair of walking boots at five or six years old. You know, and I can remember having this constant mini supply of walking boots that she had outgrown that I was then having to sell on eBay or a car boot sale or wherever because you know you paid good money for them so these all these little mini scarpers were were building up and I'd keep the boxes and clean them down and pop them back in the box and sell them um, ready for the next pair so yeah encourage encourage the youngsters to get out uh, as much as you can because there is that period where they will shy away from it like I did almost, I guess, you know, you, you just don't do it for a while, but then you come back to it. It's something that if you've been fed it um, when you're young, you return to it later on. And it's not something that they will um, tell you that you've done wrong. You know, you always think that the teenagers are going to moan at you or the children are going to moan at you. For, oh, why are you taking me here? I don't want to do this. But actually that's all part that's all part and parcel of them growing up. They have, they need to have a grumble and a complain, and yeah, let let them experience it in their own way. Um, so yeah, I think I think that was my my preparation really for the big one. Um, I am just sorry that I didn't didn't do it sooner. Um, in terms, the second the second question, second part of that question was, I can't remember. <laughs> advice and tips for other women who want to get out and do some walking and get oh, outside that's right. yes. um it is as simple as just do it i have had so many people say to me oh gosh i couldn't even walk a mile let alone 25 or let alone 630 or let alone 870 and i've just said to them all you're doing is walking. You're not running a marathon. You're not training for a marathon. You, you can actually walk yourself fit. Um, and in fact, the Southwest Coast Path, I did have to do that. Although I had done some training walks, I actually got really sick just before my 40th birthday. In fact, it was in the April. I was 40 in the May. And in the April, I got what this this chesty cough thing and and it lasted for 12 weeks and I'd been to the hospital I'd had you know x-rays and all sorts of inhalers and tablets you name it I'd had it and I almost I didn't think I was going to be able to go at one point and in the end I just said no I've been planning this now for seven or eight months I am going whatever I didn't feel fit I didn't feel walk fit but I started off slow. Okay, I was carrying a lot of weight on my back and that obviously I soon had to sort out. But, you know, I maybe walked eight or nine miles the first day. Next day, 10 or 11 miles, you know, gradually building it up. Um, 
doing what I felt I was capable of doing. And before I knew it, I was I was walking 20, 22 miles with ease and not actually thinking about it. You know, that's something that happens over a period of weeks. So if, if it's something that people are wanting to do on a on a a whim on a daily basis or on a weekend you know let's let's go out I fancy going out for a walk just go and do it and don't worry about going out on your own even if it's just for a day walk I see plenty of of females out there walking on their own and I'm pretty certain that there's so many people out there that think in fact, I know there are people out there that think this because they've said it to me. I don't like walking on my own if I haven't got my dog or if I, I'm not with somebody because I, f- I feel like people will look at me. F- I don't know what this thing is about females feeling like somebody's going to think ill of them because they're walking on their own. What you're doing is you're going out to connect with your surroundings, to think, to be mindful to get some vitamin D, to get some exercise. There's absolutely nothing wrong in that. And there's, I would absolutely advocate whether it's a walk around the local park, you know, start with a walk around the local park, or whether it's a, a, a 10 mile jaunt, you know, day jaunt across the coast or across the fields. Just do it. It's There's nothing, absolutely nothing that you should be feeling ashamed about or frightened of because you're walking on your own it's it's a natural thing to do absolutely so you are on twitter what is your twitter handle (laughs) sure i went my mind went a blank then it's at wathwalk (laughs) wathwalk absolutely fantastic so thank you so much for coming on the tough girl podcast to share more about how you got into walking and oh and just sharing more about your love and passion for it and explaining more about the south southwest coastal path it's been absolutely inspirational to have you on the tough girl podcast it's been an absolute pleasure and so exciting to talk to you as well sarah thank you so much for inviting me Hey Tribe, I hope you're well. Thank you so much for listening to that episode. I hope you enjoyed it and it's given you some thoughts and ideas about a future walk that you could go and do on. One of the things that I particularly liked is I sometimes feel with challenges and adventures that people think they've got to be epic and extraordinary and you've got to travel far away to go and have an adventure whereas actually you can look on your own doorstep and look around you and see what ignites your your passion and your interest and what gives you gives you that spark basically so I also think Zoe, Zoe's an incredible storyteller I can just really imagine her going on this journey and what she was going through and finding out more about herself so I have actually interviewed a lot of other women who've been walking. And if you're interested in walking, especially, then I've got some recommendations for you. Go and take a listen to Kat Davis on the Tough Girl podcast. She is from the blog Following the Arrow. There is so much information on there. It's really well worth looking into, whether it's Hadrian's Wall you want to look at, the PCT, um, Hadrian's Walls. There's lots of UK walks, lots of international walks. We also talk on the podcast about her pilgrimage in Japan, um, which I'm completely going to forget the name of now. But really, really interesting. Um, obviously, you can listen to my episode about through hiking the Appalachian Trail, where my sister Caroline Wellingham interviews me. I've also spoken with Jessica Mills. Her trail name is Dixie, and Dixie through hiked the Appalachian Trail as well. She did it. You know, I was doing mine in a hundred days. Dixie took about I think five and a half, six months, and also vlogged her challenge as well. But lots of information about getting out there going and doing a hike like this my 100th episode of the tough girl podcast was with cheryl strayed from who wrote the book wild an incredible woman incredible author and when she was dealing with the loss of her mum and, and going through this period of grief, she headed out to the pct and we talked with cheryl not necessarily from the what she took and uh, the planning and the preparation, but more around the the mental attitude, the mental side of things, you know, what she learned from going on that journey, which was really about finding herself again. She went through this this period where her life was completely out of sync and the decisions that she was making weren't in they weren't fitting with her principles of how she wanted to live her life. So definitely go and take a listen to Cheryl Strayed. That's a phenomenal episode. 
Now, one of the other things that Zoe talked about was wild camping and wild sleeping or cowboy camping or whatever you want to, to call it. And We've spoken with another expert called Phoebe Smith, who is into extreme sleeping, and she gives lots of practical advice if you are going to be going while camping, camping outdoors by yourself, being a solo. Please do go take a listen to Phoebe Smith. Bex Band, we have interviewed from The Ordinary Adventurer. She also loves, loves, <laughs> she is also from Love Her Wild, which is well worth checking out. It's a great resource for women who want to get outdoors, get an adventure. They run lots of trips. Do go check out the website, Love Her Wild. Dot com. Bex did a 1,000 kilometer walk across Israel and talks more about how she got into adventuring. And again, very, very inspiring, lots of practical advice. And most recently, we spoke with Alex Mason, who is Bex Band's co-founder of Love Her Wild. So Alex and Bex both started um, Love Her Wild together. And Alex has been on an incredible journey. She headed off to through hike the PCT from Mexico all the way up to Canada, came back to the UK, started a job again and was like, actually, this isn't what she wanted to do. Ended up going back to the PCT to through hike it the other way. So she walked from Canada, well, you know, the top of America, all the way down to Mexico, then not, yeah, to Mexico, and then ended up flying over to New Zealand to do the Te Oroa Trail, which, oh, we're going to take a listen to Anna McNuff because she's run the Te Oroa Trail. And then Alex um, headed over to Sydney where she then cycled from Sydney all the way to Melbourne and then all the way up the center of Australia. So there's lots of incredible stories about there about women doing long distance hiking trails. So if there's something that you're interested in, there's lots of resources. So there's names again for you are Kat Davis, Jessica Mills, Cheryl Strade, Phoebe Smith, Bex Band, Alex Mason, and myself. Um, also, don't forget, don't forget to go and take a listen to, if you haven't already, Ari, Ari Beresford-Webb, who's now Ari Kane. Ari was the first person to run around Wales when the new coastal path was built. And that's who Zoe was talking about. Zoe and Ari are really good friends. And I actually ended up meeting them both at the Women in Adventure Expo when it first came out. So that must have been like two years ago. So it's, it's quite weird, like all these different connections which are coming out. But thank you so much for listening to the Tough Girl podcast. All the show notes can be found at Tough Girl Channel challenges.com you can find all of the links to the episodes that i have talked about you can also find more information about myself the different books that i've written i also do want to end the episode with just saying a big thank you to my patrons i it's quite it's quite difficult because i'm very conscious that there are so many of you who listen to me every single week and i'm sure every every week you hear you hear the same chat or the same spiel of me talking about uh, my patrons and thanking them and how you can become a patron by going to patreon.com and you've probably sort of switched off by now but I am very conscious that we do have a lot of new listeners who are hopefully finding the podcast who hopefully listen to one episode and think "Ooh, that was interesting I've learned a lot from that I feel motivated I feel inspired let me go back and take a listen to the other episodes that I've that I've put out and I think if you start listening again, you'll probably realize that actually I don't really start talking about Patreon until maybe, maybe it was like June or July in 2016, but the podcast has been going for such a long, a long time now. Um, for those of you who don't know, it started back on the 4th of August in 2015 with four episodes and I've been putting out a new episode every single week since then. And it is just growing and growing and growing and building and building and building. I'm trying to reach 500,000 downloads by the end of this year. To be honest, I'm not sure it's going to happen. I'm at 400. 115,000 downloads. And I was actually getting like a little bit disappointed almost. I was thinking, why isn't this happening? Why aren't more people finding the Tough Girl podcast? And then I just thought, you know what, I just need to be relaxed and calm about it. Because actually, if I to stand in front of 415,000 people, and obviously I know that there will be repeat listeners, so it's probably like half that, like 200,000 people have listened. That's actually, that's insane amount of women and men to have connected with. And it's an incredible thought that all of these stories are now being shared and people are hearing about these women who are going out there and doing these phenomenal challenges who don't get the publicity that they deserve which is what tough girl podcast is all about it's about increasing the amount of female role models it's about sharing the stories of women like zoe who zoe who are you know they're coming up to their 40th birthday they want to do a big celebration they go out and do an incredible challenge which is so close to their own heart and they've done something which they never thought was possible and how it's changed their their life and, and given them you know new goals and new outlets and it's just I think it's just really really inspiring and we don't get to hear about women generally who do um, who do these challenges so 
If you want to get involved and you want to help and support, then you can help and support me financially every single month by becoming a patron. I'm asking for $2 a month, $5 a month, $10 a month, whatever it is that you can afford. Because like everything in this world unfortunately you know nothing is free everything does come at a cost whether it's the website hosting cost the hosting fees for the podcast my my time to edit the podcast to to interview these incredible women to write the show notes to put it all up on social media and to engage with with you out there um so i do just want to thank everybody who has become a patron so far there's about 130 women who are backing the tough girl podcast and tough girl challenges which is absolutely amazing i'd love to reach 150 by the end of the year so if you've been listening to the tough girl podcast for a while now and you're getting some value from it and it's helping or it's improving your life in some way then please do think about giving back investing helping me to expand and grow it to reach more women out there to help them achieve their own challenges and goals so thank you again for all your incredible support go out there and get after what you want to do don't let family don't let friends stop you from following your passions and your dreams if you want to go something if you want to do something if you want to go somewhere then please just take that first step today. That's what I'd love for you to do. Take that first step towards achieving that dream and that goal. Have an awesome Tuesday or whatever day it is that you're listening to Tough Girl Podcast. But I will be with you next Tuesday for another episode. New episodes come out every Tuesday at 7am UK time. All right, take care, lots of love, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye. Bye.